that she's lying. And he says why. So that's coming up in just a moment. But before we get to that, let's jump in with the World in 90 Seconds from CBS. Folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is a special edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, coming to you live on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live, and download our free app and stream all of our live local shows, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and the Jake Feinberg Show. We're full on extraterrestrial radio streaming worldwide and we appreciate you making us part of your day today without further ado i want to bring in a, a cat who uh has been on my radar since i started my program five years ago and quite honestly i was vexed as to how to connect with this guy um actually i had doubt that i ever would um and then the other day um i'm looking at this album that i had of his um you know uh, from 81 on fantasy and it just dawned on me. I said, you know, maybe Michael Shreve might have some connection with with uh, this this cat. And uh, you know, I just did my third interview with Michael, and um, and so I I reached out to him, and he gave me this email, but it had a hyphen in it, and it bounced back, and and so then I was even more discouraged. And then, uh, but Michael did some digging for me, and uh, and and then uh, was able to connect me with this this man, a master pianist, a guy who w- thrived in the East Bay, uh, really at a time when there was so much cross-pollinization of music that was going on. He was right in the middle of it, fearless, playing black clubs, uh, ultimately playing with Carlos Santana. Uh, He's continued to have his own career moving forward. Uh, A melodic improviser, Tom Coster, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that's uh, that's quite an introduction, uh, Jake. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure, my friend. I, it's so it is such an honor to connect with uh, with you. You know, I I mean, I'm going back, I'm going back to uh, 2011. Uh, I started my show, uh, and I didn't really know what direction I was was headed in. But then, I it, like you said just before off air, I said, well, you know, um, I I don't see a lot of authenticity in our society now. I don't see a lot of truth. And uh, I'd like to open up a portal to for dialogue for people that have not been heard of, from on a lot of these issues because we're just getting a lot of formulaic, inauthentic responses to a lot of important sure. stuff. So I, I went, sure. you know, so I went towards, I gravitated towards musicians, a lot of African jazz musicians to start, and then eventually it branched out, and it is where it is now. You know, five five years later, a thriving. Uh, independent radio show and the but the first cat I um uh, the this cat Ed Newmeister this trombone player um was we were talking about um uh he was just talking about his upbringing in Oakland and he would go to Oakland Raider games and play uh during the halftime shows in a big band but he he we were talking about the vibe of the Bay Area, and he said he mm-hmm. used to go see you at the Black Knight with the, in the Tom Coster trio with Gaylord Birch, and mm-hmm. I'm just like, my God! I mean, that was the first time you came <laughs> on my radar. I'm like, put me in that club, get me back there, let me. I, I just want to burn the entire <laughs> night, okay? Burn visceral burn, Coster, and so that's my start. I mean, my question is this. When did you um, get to a point in your, uh, not career, but just in your progression as a musician where you were able to let the technique go and just allow yourself to transcend, for lack of a better word, and, you know, let the music come through you? Maybe you could point to a specific time that that that, that really dawned on you when it was music from the heavens, you know, and, and, and I just was hoping you could riff on that. Um, well, for me, Jake, that, that's, a, that's a real important, um, I mean, that's a real in-depth question that's a bit difficult for me to answer because what's happened to me in my life now, I'm, I retired in 2014, and I'm 75 years old, and um, my life has been um, a lot, much more than I ever uh, thought it would, because I never looked at music for fame. Um, 
um, I did want to raise my wife and my two children playing and doing something that I loved, uh, never to dream that I would have the success that I had. But what's real interesting and really beautiful about me being 75, I do a lot of reflecting, 75 years old, I do a lot of reflecting on my past and the journey that I've taken um, becomes more understandable. And I don't know if when I struggled from the very, very beginning, uh, learning to play the B3 uh, after only studying accordion, <laughs> and then um, morphing from the B3 to be involved by being at the right place at the right time, which was very fortunate when keyboards just... Uh, the whole keyboard world went ballistic, as you know, with synthesizers and being able to uh, bend notes and, and, and all the MIDI stuff. And I was just in, in the, I was right in the midst of all that and a part of all that. But I never really thought of my playing being, um, trying to guide my playing, I just... I was trying to exist and do the best that I can uh, to get from one place in my life to another. As I grew older, and now that I'm older, there's a beauty and a resolve and um, a glowing feeling in my heart and in my soul that now when I do play, I do put more thought, and I'm able to say, yeah, less is more. Um, and think about things like that that I never really <laughs> thought about earlier earlier in my life. Um, as far as playing music, I've always fought to keep uh, jazz fusion alive. Obviously, you make no money at it. But that is what my heart and my soul has always really, really enjoyed. And I spent um, a great part of my life trying to keep that music alive through my own albums and, of course, working with, with Steve Smith and uh, Vital Information for many years. And, of course, I toured a lot with Cobham and and um, Bill Evans, the wonderful sax player that, uh, from New York, and, and other bands like that um, uh, has kept me in that in that fusion domain, you might say. Sure. But uh, that's, that's, that's the only way I can really... Um, answer the question i don't even know if i'm answering no i mean i, correctly. I, I mean, part of my sh i'm not a musician so i i tend to deal in the metaphysical and i and, and uh so <clears throat> the idea here is that we live in a very um uh, you know you, the drum track came along we live in a very formulaic uh, uh you go to see a live performance now and and there's so much uh you know it's just sort of pacification and uh you know at the pop level and I often, t there's only two letters that separate music and magic. And, and so I like to talk to the cats like Billy Cobham, who I've done about four and a half hours of interviews with about, mm -hmm. you know, the, I mean, Billy's never done a drug in his life. He's never drank or do drugs, but he can talk very eloquently about leaving his physical body on the bandstand. And so, oh, yes. you know, I wanted you to oh, talk, yes. I wanted you to talk about that experience where the idea of, you know, letting, you know, when you know you, you, the rudiments were there and you yeah for the last you know you left your body on the bandstand you know when you oh, left yeah. your physical can you, can you relay a story about that um the thing that's interesting about that jake is that uh that doesn't happen it's not something you can when it does happen it's it's pretty spiritual and it's almost like every single thing that's happening from the beginning of the day to where you actually get on stage uh, falls in perfect alignment. Um, I've often, tr when I get into that feeling, it is a magic carpet ride and it's extremely euphoric and you, you feel like you, your, your spirit has left the body. And uh, you have complete control over your mind and your instrument that Point and everything you're doing is, is extremely magical. The trick to that uh, is, 
and I've I've spoken to other musicians about it, is how do you harness that mm. and try to get it to happen every uh, every gig? Uh, personally, I find that to be extremely impossible to have that you euf- those euphoric evenings consistently. Now, playing on a very high level is something I've always strived for because to me. That's what I'm up on that stage for. That that I've always felt that I've given always 110 percent of myself. But that being said, not every single performance, uh, of course, um, did not have that euphoric thing. That that happens. Um, uh, it's not something that happens a lot, you know. I I mean, you wish it did. But um, and maybe everybody looks at it in a different way. Maybe that type of euphoric thing, feeling, does happen more than we know it to be, where you just get within a, a situation in your heart and your soul, and you don't even realize that you're up on stage playing in in front of people. Um, maybe it does happen more than I've I've been a, made aware of. But I know that. Certain times, it was extremely noticeable. And what happens to me, Jake, is I hold my breath. And um, after a solo that I've taken that I feel is just went over and beyond. <laughs> and when it's over, I, my goodness, it's like, oh my God, I can't. You know, you're, you've, hold, you've held your breath during the entire time. And all of a sudden you realize that you have to begin breathing again and then you start realizing what just happened. And uh, that's what I do, what's hap- what happens to me when I get into that sort of transcendental s- sort of environment musically is I, I know I've been there because I, I can't breathe. I have to start breathing again. It's, it's amazing. It's like you're, you're lifting weights and all of a sudden you realize you have to breathe because if you don't, you'll, you'll pass out. Um, so that, that's, that's all I can say about that. But, of course, I never could have control and predict it to happen. It just does. Okay. So um, do you – I mean, this is – it's absolutely fascinating. Um, can you talk about – what what's really quite amazing to me here is that uh, um, that you uh, were part of the the loading zone. Yes, okay. I love that band. Now, two of my dearest comrades on this pilgrimage that I've been on have been uh, uh, Paul Farso and uh, and George Marsh. I'm not sure. If, sure. I'm not sure if George was in the zone when you were originally in that in the group there. No, uh, he wasn't, and I took. I basically took Paul's, um, Paul's place. You probably already know that. No, I don't, actually. I don't. I don't. I don't think I did. Well, actually, it would make sense because because Paul was a, was a keyboard player. He's a keyboard yeah. player. Yeah. I, I I'm not sure exactly why he left. I know he was into um, uh, spiritualism, of course. Well, you just mentioned trans, he was a he became a teacher of TM. That's what. To, yes. Yeah, that's what happened. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was a I was involved in that with Linda for a while as well. Um, yes, he and and then I heard that uh, he and his wife. I don't know how true this is, but that there was a passing in the family, and he was able to have some funds and be be rather. Um, he could pretty much do. He and his wife could pretty much do what they wanted to, and I, that's the path they chose. But he was an amazing player. I don't know much of him. It was so long ago, and I only know what he did with the loading zone, and I never heard, personally, I never heard anything else that he's done. But um, No, I mean, it just, he, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about your, the going back to this time when, um, if you could just paint the picture for my audience of, uh, you know, coming Either before the army, before the air force, or after, uh, when you, you know, um, you know, when you first 
um, if you could talk about the scene in the East Bay and the, 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 the clubs, the, the Cold Duck Club, I've done a huge amount of research. I've just interviewed so many cats from your generation about this scene. There were so many bastions of regional music. And I, I, mm -hmm. I, I mean, when, when, when New Meister said he used to sit, we were, we were really talking about the vibe of the club. It was inherently the black. Right, the black, that was amazing. The Black yeah. Knight was a, was, a, was a black nightclub, and, and yet – uh, Newmeister said, as a, as a white cat, you know, he, he walked in there and there was. He said there was no vibe. It, it was not a bad vibe. Or it was just they were, no. you know. And I wanted you to talk about how you really got your feet wet, how you got comfortable. What, what were the clubs that you got comfortable on the bandstand before you sort of elevated to a status of, you know, obviously more Latin rock with Santana, but those, you know, really were, where you started to get comfortable on the bandstand. Well, I. I, as I mentioned earlier in this uh, interview, I I was uh, very blessed to be at the right place at the right time when when music in the 60s and 70s live music was prominent and paramount and there was you could go to the Blackhawk and see Miles and see John Coltrane you could go to the various jazz clubs on Broadway and see your heroes play people that you you, you purchase their records, and you uh, you could go and, and, and experience them. Sonny Rollins, I mean, all these am amazing people. Um, you can go and experience them live. So I was in a situation where I could I could play these clubs. Well, what happened was when I got out of the service, out of the Air Force, uh, I was told that because Jake, I never studied piano or or horizontal instruments. I just played the accordion. <laughs> and I played jazz on it. And wow. um, people all, always thought that, uh, you know, wow, this guy plays the, the crap out of that thing. And I made it sound like an organ and this and that, you know, through an amplifier and all that. And when I got out of the service, I was in the, sur in the Air Force Band for almost five years. Well, nobody in the Bay Area knew me anymore. I don't know. I don't even think I was 30 when I got out. I was in my 20s. And um, I didn't know anybody, so I was getting... I was trying to get as many gigs as I can just to pay my bills with my wife being pregnant with the first, my first uh, child, which is my, my, oldest, my oldest one, which is Tom Coster Jr., who's done pretty well in the music industry as well. Um... I found that um, it was very difficult because here again nobody knew who, who I was, and I had to I had to re reinvent myself, so to speak. And in order to pay bills, I ended up delivering mail. And fortunately, before um, before I had to pay to get my uniform, I was like a a sub. You have to you have to sub before you can become an honorary. <laughs> U.S. mailman. Well, before that happened, I got a gig at this club called the 1188 Club. Oh boy! Play, playing on on Market Street. It was a strip club. Sure. And I I took Buddy Montgomery's place. Get the, out of uh, here! Yeah. Wait, 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 wait! That dude was the vibes player. Uh, no, well, Buddy Buddy played played piano and then he went on the road with his brother Wes. Okay, so because but his buddy played piano and vibes. You're you uh, piano uh, and vibes. Yeah. yeah. I I didn't know about the vibes, but he played piano. So I took his place and it was a a really weird um well the gig was weird because we played on top of the bathroom. <laughs> and uh, No, I just want to say that 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 this is not because the mafia ran controlled so many of the nightclubs. Oh show. yes, this was this yeah. was one of them. <laughs> this is so because I know that that like uh, again bringing up Newmeister, him and Mark Levine used to do you know twenty minute uh, you know versions of Milestone while the strippers were gyrating you know in the this there was, you go go ahead yeah. go, go yeah. keep I, dude, keep going on this this is so you. So you got this gig at the 1188 Club, and yeah, taking Buddy Buddy um, Montgomery's oh my place God, because that's awesome. that's... he went back on the road with his brother Wes, and the instrument was a was a um, an upright piano, but it had this electric bar that went across the keys, <laughs> and every time you played a note, a pin would drop, 
and it would ignite a, a, a tube in this this apparatus that had 88 tubes in it, and it would make a sound like an organ, and it was called an organo. 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 How many of those have been? I mean, how? How? I've never seen one since then. An organo. Yeah. This yeah, is so like, tripped yeah, out. What yeah. a freaking cool thing. So, I mean, you, I mean, so, uh, okay, continue. This is great. So, so, so I've never played anything like that before. And here I'm a, an accordion player, you know, and I kind of taught myself how to play piano. And the first tune we played, which was the opening tune we played every night, was a very fast, very up-tempo uh, bebop tune of you know of rhythm changes you know i've got rhythm mm-hmm. well guess what i have to play the bass line oh my God. so i'm going what yeah you have to play the right hand and you have to play the bass line i says holy crap i don't <laughs> think i've i've never done this before and you know and not only that the tempo was outrageous you know and so i ended up getting my feet wet struggling like crazy to play it and then from there you know every every night I'd, I'd have to play left hand bass so I taught it to myself and then the guy says look at there's a there's a there's a, a club an after hours club and they have a, an instrument called a b3 there and I want you to play this after hours club it was called the streets of Paris mm-hmm in, in San Francisco, in the Tenderloin, it was a, obviously a very rough area, and I learned to play the B three. Wait a minute, That's hold on. You were this was this was uh, these these organ sessions, like the two to six sessions, two a.m. Yes, exa- exactly. This is so That's... unfreaking. Hold on, well, who was the trio at the eleven eighty eight club? Who was in that band? Well, there was a bunch of them. There was Tommy Smith. Um, there was another young guy. He was a he was a gay a gay kid um, played his ass off. He he didn't play there that much. He it wasn't something he really wanted to do. I think he was kind of independently wealthy. But Tommy Smith was one of the key guys. And then you know they were all black musicians. And here I come in this little skinny little kid that weighed 140 pounds, and I'm playing this black instrument and. I, I certainly didn't have it down, Jake. I was struggling. The biggest thing was when it came time for me to take a solo, to play a solo with my right hand and keep the bass going. That took me like a year to do, but I I loved it so much. The instrument was so intriguing to me that I would dream about it, you know. And here, here I still had a family. I was trying to go to school and get a degree in music, so if I failed at being being able to support my family through music, I could at least do some teaching. And um, when I first got that gig, I didn't even know how to, I, when I saw the draw bars, I didn't know how to set them. So I had to pay, we had to pay Tommy Smith, who was sitting there, five bucks to set the organ up for me. And I only made 10 <laughs> for the night. So um, it was quite an interest. And he, you know, he didn't want any competition. And then from there, I got this amazing gig with Jules Broussard at the Off Plaza, which I had for years. And that I was the only white guy in the band at that club. And it was interesting because the people, they were all black folks, and, but they loved me because here was this skinny little white kid playing, the, playing this black instrument and grooving on it. And they had the... Um, they had they showed so much love and respect for me. Uh, I had to prove myself, but I proved myself through my playing. And uh, and then there was uh, Jackson Sutter, where Chester Thompson, and I think Rudy Thompson, the Rudy Rudolph Johnson, Michael Howe, Rudolph Johnson, yeah, Rudolph Johnson, and, and and then there was this drummer Herschel Davis who sang. They're, yeah, and they were killing, man. So. You know, th- that was the rivalry, Jackson. I love it. This is so epically classic. I'm so this Tom Coster is on Power Talk. 
live. We are having a ball. You're telling me that – was it possible to play bass lines with the accordion? You never played bass lines with the accordion? No, I played bass lines on the accordion too, but they're buttons. Sure. They're little – you know, they're just buttons. Oh, that, they're buttons. Those, so they're not they, – yeah, 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 yeah. So I learned to play bass lines on the accordion. But it's a whole different thing, man, with the, with the organ, you know, and then trying to learn the pedals and – but the instrument I was intrigued by, and it, uh, at that time I've always called the organ the first synthesizer, it was so, it, it's such an amazing instrument, the way you can make it speak, the way, the technique you have to develop on the, or on the B3 to, to sound like an organ player. Like, if you take a piano player who's never played an organ before, they sound like a piano player. But if you, the difference between that and a real organ player is phenomenal. All the different things, the, the little cliches and the, the, the way you approach playing a B3, uh, the, the subtlety of using the draw bars while you're playing, and the way, oh my God, just, just the way that instrument grooves, or it just, it's, it's one of the most infectious instruments I've ever played and then from there you know people heard me as which is what happens to no, no, I don't want to anybody. I don't want to I don't want to jump too far ahead I, I the, 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 this is really important stuff because like um because the B3 was primarily a, a it was a church instrument I mean it was That's you, absolutely right and Jimmy Smith was the one who brought it out of that into the nightclub and i feel like uh -huh. it is such an underappreciated and underused uh instrument in today's world um absolutely because of synthesizers yeah oh, it just that stuff really it irks me i mean it really irks me because i just that whole synthetic it just it, it, oh it's awful it's awful and 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 here it is i mean you know there were cats out there like ed kelly Playing the yep. playing the red balloon, and you Ed Kelly, wonderful guy, and loved him. Were you going to Bop City to see Philly Joe and Coltrane and those cats? I I my brother did. Um, I don't know why I never went there. <laughs> I, I I was in the military at the time, and it was kind of hard to uh, to get there. But my brother did. I. I to this day, I, now that you're talking about Bob City, I don't know why why I never went. There was definitely it wasn't because I didn't want to go. There had to be something that prevented me from from going. I'm just yeah. you know I, I we're, this is more of an esoteric question, but you know I I look at it. You know you talk to to the cats. You know Randy Weston, Ahmad Jamal. Uh, you know go back and back and you know i mean this is a, a black jazz music is a black american art form that's how i come down that's absolutely it. correct okay? yeah I, and, I feel that i feel that way too and what i want to get at with you is when you were woodshedding here at the at the off uh what is it off plaza uh yeah streets of paris streets of paris plaza, yeah. you know can you talk about the how playing a black, you know, a, being a skinny white kid playing black music, how did that prepare you for the next level? Um, I, all I know is because we are all so unique um, as individuals, you know, the, I don't know, you know, if, if, if we, <laughs> If there's a Lord or a Supreme Being, but mm -hmm. there's somebody greater than myself, of right, course. Right, right, right. And whoever designs us makes us uniquely different. And for some reason, Jake, I have always gravitated more to black musicians. And one of the biggest reasons was the way they swing. The swing factor, to me... Uh, I tended to embrace it more. And when I was young, there was a definitive West Coast, East Coast sound. Absolutely. And it was it was amazingly uh, defined. 
Can you talk? Can you, you, you could you could you talk anymore. to that? To, to, I would love. I mean, because I I mean there was a there was a, a a different sound between West Coast jazz in Southern California and and in San Francisco. But I just oh but, sure. Yeah. But I mean, a lot of people say the East Coast was burning, visceral. Uh, you know the the that East Coast just inferno, and then the West Coast was just. It still swung hard, but there was groove, more funk, more R and B, uh, more Gulf Coast. But I mean, can you break it down? I mean, can you talk about those how def- how defined those two styles were? And I think well, I can yeah, I can only I can only relate to you how I that's all I'm asking. It. Yeah, I don't want you to do yeah, it. yeah you're, you're not I, I a, you're know. not a prophet, okay? I just want the top, yeah, I, I want know, the Coster thing. One of the things that I've I've learned in life is. It's, it really is just my opinion. That's right. Um, there, <laughs> to me, the East Coast at that time, it, and we've already determined that it was a very definitive sound, they burned harder. And I liked the, the harmonic, the way they used, seemed to use harmonies, um, chord progressions, uh, voicings, and things like that caught my eye, uh, caught, excuse me, my ear in a very distinctive manner. Uh, I loved West Coast, the West Coast jazz. Of course, I bought many, many albums by artists from the West Coast, you know, Shelly Mann, which I eventually played at Shelly's Club with Gabor Zabo. You played the manhole um, with Zab. I This is just stunning. Yeah, wow. it was amazing. Wow. It was a great. I got to meet Shelley, and you know the people you dream about when you when you're young and you get to to play in their clubs and meet them. But um, to me, the mu- the West Coast music was a little happier. Yeah. And whether that's indicative of the lifestyle <laughs> in L.A., you know that the sun all the time, the beaches and all that. I agree. Here. No, I think you're spot on, man. I, I there there was something also. I mean. It it was it was not light, airy, and swinging. It just it had a funk. It it just had a looser, um, up upbeat mentality. It it it, it was it, it smoked, but it just didn't. Oh, yeah. oh, it yeah. didn't have that visceral. Um, you know, it wasn't Rashid Ali. And no, it didn't have the anger. The it, was, well, the, I mean, the, people the, see. Here's the thing. You know, this is one of these things. If I was a, I just pray. I mean. And I consider myself a, a good independent journalist, music journalist, and I, I just hope that I wouldn't have been one of these white writers in the early '60s calling uh, trains modal music hate music. I mean, there, no, there was nothing. No. But but you said it was angrier, right? I mean, I mean, well, well, see, see, to, that's a, that's probably a, a not a good word. Um, when I play, if I'm in a rhythm section that swings in a way that reminds me of an East Coast rhythm section of that era, it makes me play harder Mm -hmm. and maybe a little angrier, but I don't mean anger from a hatred place. Um, I think I think the word a little bit more hardcore. Yeah, I think the word might be edgier or harder. Yes, there you go. That that's it. That's it. Right. Yeah, it, and and the East Coast music of that era, to me, they were always reaching for something new and unique. They were taking it to another a level through my interpretation of it. The West Coast was like driving um, a convertible along the beach and, and, and having some swinging music and enjoying life. I will say, I want to ask you, I, I, let me ask you your opinion on this. Uh, the, the one thing about the, the West Coast, um, in the Bay and in the Southern California, there was, um, and it's still this way today with technology, it's just there was this need for inve- con- continually inventing. Um, mm-hmm. So there was new instruments. I, th- I think of a, a dear friend of mine, Emil Richards, who right, collected I as well. okay like i mean we're talking about microtonal patterns or or harry parch who created the 42 tone octave or whatever and then you had the gravity adjusters band with tom donlinger and lee charlton and these cats who were like 
you know, making, they were the first guys who made water phones. I mean, there, there was something about stretching the imagination and the sonic nature of the music as well. Do you, I mean, for the West coast, uh, aside from just swinging by the bay, you know? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't remember or relate too much to that. The only thing that I feel, uh, kind of pull it along those directions is because when you when you look at LA it's so uh, it's not one of my favorite places in the world mm-hmm. I enjoy going there and playing there on occasions uh, well I played there a lot of course before I retired but um, it seems like with the film industry and all that um, there's a lot of there's a lot of searching in that direction to, for soundtracks and, and coming up with different uh, approaches to writing soundtrack through that media. Absolutely. But I, I, I never thought of it, that whole thing, uh, being a part of the West Coast. Maybe I just didn't pay attention to it because I was paying attention well, you know, to and then, you know, in fairness, the struggle. Well, no, life. but in fairness, when you yeah. were, uh, you know, when Emil moved, when Emil was in a trio with uh, Toshiko Akiyoshi and Eddie Marshall uh, mm-hmm. in New Haven. Oh, yes. In, they, New, in New Haven. Yeah, Gary Hahn, Jerry Hahn, yeah. Well, that was, the, right. the, you know, I mean, Emil moved, he moved to Southern California in the early 60s when, quite frankly, you were just probably starting out in the Air Force, so it would have made sense if you didn't, if, if, right. if you wouldn't click right. into that. I mean, you were doing your own thing. I think we broke that down. I just again, I, I wonder about. I think you you hit it on the head. The the, the, the black music inherently, um, because of the African rhythms and the diaspora, and the the danceable rhythms, they it swung harder, and mm-hmm. and and so in that sense, how did you grow as a musician? Well, I. I, I I listened to, there were so many black musicians at that time that were paramount in my, in, in I, I tried to listen to music, um, I tried to make it a daily thing to listen to music. Uh, I always found time to spend several hours a day listening to music to get ideas and just to keep up on things. And I found myself listening to the artist for various reasons. Like, of course, Paramount was Coltrane, Miles. Um, I listened to them for different things. Um, And then I listened to people like Oscar Peterson more for for playing with a good percussive time yeah, right. Feel because um, he swung in a very different way uh, than, for example, like a Red Garland who plays all these beautiful flowery chords, but had a completely different feeling of swing. I think what was what I feel so grateful for, Jake, is that when I listened to all these people, I was able to understand in my own way conceptually how each of them had an effect on my being. Hmm. Uh, the, in, intrica- the intricacy of uh, Bill Evans' voicings, um, the, the simplicity of, um, let's see if I can, I can't think of all the artists at this time, but they were, the people I listened to the most were definitely black musicians and and the interesting thing about it as I even in the Air Force uh, before I actually began my my musical journey in the Bay Area I noticed this amazingly different thing that happened when Tony Williams and Ron Carter came into playing with Miles they no longer just played straight ahead um, you know, ding, 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 dotted eighth note to the sixteenth note swing, but they broke the time up, mm-hmm. and that just that just messed me up. I said, "Wow, this is so beautiful! They're breaking up the time. There's freedom, and then all of a sudden, 
as as on 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 my funny Valentine, all of a sudden they start going into time, and it was it was amazing. It just lifted my entire being. So that whole concept of no longer just playing hard bop, but breaking up the time and 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 everybody having a space to to create, and then all of a sudden, as the choruses went by. You started to. Everybody started to swing the tune. That was a huge, huge thing. And then, of course, after that whole thing um, became a whole new way of rhythm sections playing. I think it was the beginning of of changing um, the way jazz was played. It was oh, yeah, a I whole mean, you're, other. You're, this is a. I mean, we are talking to a genius. This is so classic, dude. This is cl- I'm not a genius. No, 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 but Costa, I got to, I mean, seriously, man, I really was, I mean, sometimes this stuff is right in front of your face. I, I, I held this record, this, this record from 81, you're in this full white, you know, like, like this, uh, Banana Republic, uh, you know, attire and, and uh, what's the name of the album? I don't, I, uh, it's just, it's a white, it's on fantasy and, uh, oh yeah. Do you have, do you have the, the, the records? The CDs I did with JVC. Uh, no, I only collect vinyl, so I don't have anything on uh, on as a. Oh my th- God, they are out of this world, man. No, we'll, we'll. I mean, here's the thing: the the the. This is so. I am, you know. I know we just became friends on Facebook, but I have interviewed so many cats like Lenny White. I've been just trying to 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 get to the idea. I'm so obsessed with human beings playing r- jagged rhythms, different rhythms, like you just talked about. Tony and and Ron and and actually that was another question I had like sort of more more of an esoteric question is the idea that like you know they like I remember talking to drummers like Alan Schwartzberg Studio Cats who would go to the Village Gate to see Miles with the quintet when he had Tony and Ron I mean he said that they'd play similar the, the same sets every night but every they never played the same song once <laughs> well see that's that's yeah. what i love about jazz when people say well how come you don't want to take this gig with this band you know and that's paying a lot of money and this and that and i say yeah i can't i can't stand playing the set the same way every night sure you have to play the head of the tune but once it's your time to to have a conversation, um, your chance is when, when it's your time to solo. That's your chance to let the audience know how you feel and what you f- and how you feel and what you feel about the tune at that time. And the whole idea is to be creative every single night. That's what I love about it, and the interaction that you can create between the the bass player and the drummer each night by the conversation that you have. And that, to me, is just a gift, a total gift. And I wish, I wish everybody could understand that. I know that jazz is not understood by the mass media, especially the young kids today. They don't, I don't think they even know about it, even though it is a, a great part of our history of our country. But um, that's what I love about it, Jake. I love the fact that you can create every day. Well, I think, and I, and I, and I think that what I wanted to ask you about is what you were listening for. You talked about Oscar uh, with a percussive, totally different concept of of uh, swing. But the, but I think what a lot of younger cats are lacking today. First of all, v- vocabulary of melodic improvisation is. Is taking is taking place within academia, and I don't think that that's really the place where music can grow. Exactly. And then number exactly. two, uh, people have huge technical chops, and I applaud them for it. And they can, you know, like I remember my first interview with with Michael Shreve, such an eloquent, articulate, brilliant person in his own yeah, right. Lo- I love him. Just I a, love Michael. Just a genius and a wonderful person. And and you know, he was he's like you know you can transcribe an Elvin Jones solo. But it's not going to come out the way the, it's not going to sound that 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 way, you know. And and what I'm trying to get at is the idea of time feel, just feel. And were you listening? Mm-hmm. Were you listening to Miles because of his feel? I mean, to me, uh, it, uh, you know, I'm doing a, a documentary on um, 
I was hired to uh, to be uh, a producer on this documentary for Stan Getz. I told you, and uh, right, you know, I, and I, I look, yeah, and you know, and I, and I, I, he said he had a great line. Uh, and it's escaping me now. It's a, it's not the mode, it's the mood, the mood. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's like mm -hmm. it's about that. It's about feel. It's about mm -hmm. and it's about big ears. And I think that that's something that's coming up short now. A lot of younger cats have had digital beats crunched into their ears for about two decades. I don't think they sure. even know what they're supposed to be listening to. So, no, that's the sad part of. You know. Yeah, and and so I mean, uh, you know, did you did you have? Do you feel like you you had big ears, or how did you? Who, oh who, yeah, you, you, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, in uh, fact, yeah. I didn't even know that until people brought it to my attention because when I was playing at the streets of Paris. I, and we would, uh, people in the audience would re give, give uh, Sammy Simpson, the black tenor player, a, a dollar to play a tune. Um, I, I didn't really know that tune, and but so much of the music of that era were, were two fives oriented tunes, and I could hear, with, with some exceptions of the t if, if the tune was, you know, uniquely written. Uh, most of the tunes of that era had similar chord progressions, and I could pretty much tell where the next bar was going to go harmonically and chordally. So uh, I, I, I don't know how it happened, but it does. It did. And the guys would turn to me and say, man, you've got big ears. <laughs> and my brother just, yeah, my brother just told that to me I have a brother who's a wonderful jazz player, man. He's one of my favorite. What's his name? He, Al Coster. I got to get to that cat too. Yeah, he plays. I'm going gonna, gonna to put the Coster cool. family on the uh, get him. I mean, you. you <laughs> I'm going to put you into the Hall of Fame, no doubt about. It. No, but I mean, you know, he, he, you're very he, kind. Well, no, it's 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 just cool because uh, I think it's just these. Are, I mean, I I, I I more and more as I get into my show I, and I. I realize that there's also like this, um, uh, you know, that there are super um, talented younger players on the scene now. But, you know, there's just a different the way things are disseminated. The music industry is not an industry anymore. It's just probably more equivalent to a, a small business, uh, really. Uh -huh. um, there's no touring circuit. Uh, you guys actually had identities. I mean, you guys, you know, and, and to me, it was just an emboldening thing. And it was a much more sort of, in, in, uh, you know, uh, you know. I look at it and I say it was experiential learning all the way. I mean, you were playing two gigs, in, two gigs a night, six nights a week. Uh, you know, how can yeah, you? Yeah, I, I play two gigs a night, and then on Sundays, I played a morning show at the at the Off Plaza from six to ten. So I'd come from the after hours gig and goes directly to. Um, it was seven to ten, so I had like forty-five minutes to get some chow, uh, and then seven in the morning to ten, and that and that was killing because a lot of the the like the Duke Ellington band would be in town, or um, Buddy Rich's band, and and because of a lot of bands being at these jazz clubs, because jazz was alive and well in those days. I got to play with Roy Haynes, who sat in, Rasan Roland Kirk, <laughs> Thelonious Monk, um, sat right in front of me, in front of the organ, uh, you know, when I was playing Well You'd Needn't, which is a tune that he wrote, which is a great tune. And wait, 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 the, the, were, they in, were they in the Duke Ellington Orchestra? Like, how, did, how did they? No, th those guys were playing at the smaller jazz clubs, but um, when Duke Ellington's band would come into town, um, the lead trumpet player would come in and play at the streets of Paris almost every night. And the guys from Buddy's band, Ernie Watts, they would come in and play. Um, they just wanted to keep playing. I, so they would I, no, finish, it was incredible. Well, you know, two. in fairness to Ernie Watts, I mean, he was one of my first interviews. And, and that dude uh, was so prolific in the in Southern California. He was so prolific in the studio scene that guys like him and Emil Richards and, and those cats, they just would go out at night and just play for free because they just wanted to blow, you know. They were just they, yeah. That that's that's what we all did. We just wanted to. We wanted to. It, it was an adventure, and it was an incredible. Jake, the feeling that that all of that gave all of us was 
like feeding us the spiritual, um, uh, how would you say, uh, magic potion. Yeah. It had nothing to do with money. It had to do with feeling the music and moving and moving to a new height and trying to take the music in a little different direction. That was always something that I really wanted to do as a player. It, you know, obviously it's not always accepted, but that was the purpose besides playing is to all to try to be adventurous um, in your in your musical achievements. Talking to Tom Coster here on the Jake Feinberg Show. I mean, uh, can you talk about how you started collaborating with Gaylord Birch? Well, Gay- Gaylord, um, if I'm not mistaken, I didn't play a lot with Gaylord uh, on the organ. The, the way I played with Gaylord was <laughs> if people... Uh, couldn't make the gig over in Oakland because I lived I lived in in San Bruno at the time, which is you know closer to San Francisco, which was on the other side of the bay. Sure. And and I would play with Gaylord primarily when I would get a call, usually on my night off, which I only had one night off, and they would say, Tom, we really need you to play organ. Our organ player can't make it. But you know, eventually Gaylord, I I played with Gaylord. With Santana, you probably know that. I had no, I didn't. I I always thought it was Michael or Lear. I you, I, you Gaylord played with Carlos. Yeah, he played with us for a while. Yeah. Oh my! I, it wasn't just, a long period. And you know, and Dugo, yeah. and Dugo Leon Chancellor played with us too. That that I, yeah, for a minute I can say I I knew I, there's some great shots of him at a live show. Uh, I just I saw an image of him one time, and I've interviewed in Dugo a bunch. He, the, the guy's freaking awesome. He's a wonderful, wonderful man and a very dear friend. Yeah. I, I, you know, going back to the spiritual. I mean, I don't care if it was McLaughlin or it was. Uh, I mean, to a lesser extent. I mean, you know, the 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 bands of that, that weather reports and the return to forevers. Uh, you, sure. know, you know, and I, I, you know, I've I've interviewed Stanley. I've interviewed Lenny White. I've interviewed Alphonse Muzon, Miroslav Vitus. Uh, haven't okay. gotten to Wayne Shorter yet, but I mean, you know, and you know, it's like. Uh, there's something about the human being, the love that was being transmitted at that time where you guys said, yeah, you know, we got to sing for our supper, but we are interested in sonically stretching this music out and doing it as a team. And that's yes. why I've, I've put my finger on this time. Um, I'm locked in. I've created this niche and I am marinating in it and it keeps getting deeper and denser and more beautiful because all you guys are really essentially the same people in the sense that, you know, it's hard fire love, man. I, mean, I, I don't, you mm-hmm. know, and, and, and it's very authentic. And like I said, I go back to the beginning of why I started my show is authenticity. Were you, sure. were you, sure. were, were you kicking pedals uh, on the organ? Yeah, not, not, not that much. I, um, this, this, <laughs> this white kid, I don't remember his name. He was, an, he was, Kind of an okay organ player, but he showed me this trick, <laughs> and uh, I noticed that on slow nights Jimmy Smith would do it too. Um, there's a if you play, of course, with your left foot because your right foot's on the expression pedal. Um, if you hit the if you hit that B natural, which is pretty much below your foot at that time at that point when you're sitting at sitting on the organ stool and you thump it and you don't pull the draw bar out all the way to maximum you pull it out to about let's say if it goes to 10 you pull it out to like 8 yes and you play the bass line and you hit that at the same time as a false note it really sounds like you're playing the pedals it's pretty amazing and uh, a lot of organ players do it, but then of course there's a lot of organ players who play the, you know, really play the bass pedals as well. But well, I got the, away the, with actually, it. the truth is that I'll tell you this much: I talk, you know, uh, you know the cat John Turk. Yeah. Okay, so Johnny and I we, we cooked we we were we did an interview about a month ago, two months ago, and 
He said very clearly, most cats don't kick pedals. Most pat cats play the bass line with their with their left hand. Uh, oh no, no, oh no! We all play with the left hand. Don't misunderstand me. Yeah, no, I'm saying it's everybody very everybody plays with their left hand. Right. Yeah, you can't get the nuances on the pedal. The pedal is like um, it gives us it gives it a little more thunder. But if you if if you because I I recently well not recently probably two years ago. Uh, time is going by so fast for me, Jake, that I keep thinking it's recently. But my brother was playing this this club in um, in San Francisco, and uh, you don't even get paid. You just pay for, I think, tips. Yeah, yeah, and, right. Um, you play for you play for this the an organ yeah, trio, and yeah. I said I said to my brother, "Yeah, man, listen, as long as I'm not touring, I'll play the gig with you." And it was every. Friday night, or no? It it was it was Friday, starting at five, and then another band would come in at nine o'clock or whatever. And man, this organ, you know, not all B threes are the same. They're all, you know, there's not like the synthesizers of today where they all are exactly the same. They're they're such a, they're almost human, so they all have their own characteristics. And this one, man, it had the greatest sound and I hadn't played organ and left hand bass I played been playing organ in all the bands but not not left hand bass so I got to 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 start doing it again you know re recreate the adventure and I swear to God Jake my brother and I would get in into these grooves so deep that we just didn't want to stop playing and we would look at each other and just have the biggest smiles on our face, and that was worth the entire gig. And I and I, I was so happy that all of that came back to me, and and reminded me on of what an amazing, powerful swinging instrument that that Hammond B three is. You know, before we wrap up set one, we're going to do about nine sets with Tom Coster, but I just wanted to um, ask you about how you. Uh, connected with with Gaber Zabo. Um, I I was playing with the zone. See, who was I playing with? The Loading Zone, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I was playing with the Loading Zone, and uh, we had a pretty interesting band. We had um, this bass player in the band named Dougie Rouch. Yeah, he dude, was, are you kidding me? Doug Roush was the one that <clears throat> I just did. I interviewed, uh, did my second interview with Greg Rico last week, and he's the one. Dougie Roush called Rico and was like, hey, man, because Gre Greg had left Sly, and he's like, hey, man, I'm hanging out with this bass player, Miroslav Vichus, you know, and so next thing you know, Rico's jamming with Vichu Vichus. M Muzon got fired from Weather Report, and that's how Rico right. wound up with weather with weather report. So of course, Dougie Roush, man, that that dude, rest in peace, man, was a monster. Yeah, he was a unique kid. I toured with him for a few years with Santana, of course. Of course. But, be but before then, we he was working with the Voices of East Harlem. Oh my God, I love that and group. It, yeah, I think that's a New York based group, and he he came out to the West Coast. And he, um, we heard about him, and he ended up playing with us in the loading zone. And somebody, somebody said, somebody told us that Gabor was looking for uh, a new direction. He was still playing acoustic guitar, but he wanted to. He played in a guitar called an Ovation, and he it, it was somewhat electric. But it wasn't like a hollow body. I mean, sure, a, a sure. solid body. Sure. It was a hollow body. Yeah. And he wanted to, to get into more of an electric vibe. So his manager called me, and I, and I said, of course, I, I love Gabor's music. I said, but I've never done drugs. I don't smoke cigarettes. I'm not much of a drinker. Because, Jake, I'm really a nerd musician. That's Just fine. Well, play. I mean, a lot, some of the most gifted cats in the world. Don't worry about it, man. You know, teetotalers or there's a place for there they can still burn, you know. Oh yeah, believe me. <laughs> but anyway, like, but, but Gabor was a junkie, so yeah, that's true. Yeah, he was a junkie, and I said, man, I I can't work with that with him if he's gonna, you know, be on on heroin because I just can't do it. I I don't have the kind of money to just throw away if this guy goes 
goes uh, south. berserk on me. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, right. so, so he hired me, and then he hired Doug Rauch, and he hired this, this drummer man that was also in the Voices of East Harlem named Spider Rice. Oh, I've interviewed Spider Rice, man. Are you, you have? kidding me, Kenneth? And Spider it was like some Spider Web, yeah, man. Was, Are you? I yeah. I had no, dude. Yeah. I cannot believe that. It was, it was pretty that. smoking. Holy, <laughs> that is. Where are the tapes of that stuff, man? I don't know. You want man. to talk about going were. in a different direction? That's about as different a direction as you could possibly go, man. Yeah. So it took a bar into. You know, a whole other. That is such. That's the greatest uh, place, story. Uh, that yeah. made that made possibly made my month of September already. Just <laughs> Dude, Spider Web is. I mean, we did a cos. I'll send you these interviews. They're cosmic, but I mean, that's. I well, mean, your interviews are awesome, man. The one with Mikey, I loved. It. Well, yeah, that, that's loved really it. just. I mean, I mean, it's just uh, skim scratch. Some of the stuff you're going to lose your mind because you're not going to believe that. I mean, I've been on this trek for. For five years, and and but I think more importantly, um, I, I this the voices of East Harlem they did a bunch of they did a couple of albums, but um, they were um, a traveling live outfit, and that was and yeah. and Dougie and and Spider were were doing their their were their backing band. Uh huh. Wow. Um. Yeah. They well they played in the band. Yeah, they were the musicians in the band. So what kind of, I mean, you went down and you played the manhole with that group? Uh, we played Shelley's manhole, and we played a lot of gigs at Dante's. Oh, my God. This is um, all, And we played the, the, the Lighthouse, which one of my favorite albums is Cannonball Adderley, Live at the Lighthouse. And here I got, I got to play the Lighthouse. I mean... Uh, yeah, I did the last I did the last interview ever with Howard Rumsey, rest in peace. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I, I mean, were you playing, yeah. I mean, were, were you... You were playing gypsy jazz. I mean, you could not have been playing straight ahead jazz. I mean, this is like... no, no, very rarely, and that was kind of why. Oh, this is awesome. I think he wanted us in the band because I played. He he never had a Hammond player, oh. so I played Hammond, and I wrote some 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 cool tunes for him too, uh, along with, of course, the tunes that that he's his own tunes and the tunes that he's known for, like breezing, breezing and stuff like that. But I played um, Rhodes uh, and organ and clavinet with him, so it was a whole different sound with the power of those electric keyboards, along with you know Dougie, of course, and Spider, and this kid Tom Bryant, who was kind of an okay guitarist. He wanted another guitar player. You know how Gabor always had another guitar player. Always, always, yeah. Yeah, and the kid was kind of a rock cat. He wasn't deep in harmony or anything but he found a way <laughs> to to fit in this is un. this is i, I just uh costa can we can we can we do part two like next week uh, i i just would yeah, like, i sure. just i just want to keep k kicking this around man i i it is so, it is so great to connect with you man it is such sure a um in fact you know it would be so next week i won't be available um I will be available on Thursday and Friday. And the reason I'm telling you this, Jake, is yeah. because I only live in my home in California about uh, six months, six to seven months out of the year. I have a another, uh, uh, my wife and I have a condo in Nuevo Vallarta, which is by Puerto Vallarta. Yeah, I, I, so I think we, I'm going to need to come down and hang there for a minute. You know, I'm not, you can. You, I'm not too to. far away, man. Yeah, <laughs> and we spend the entire winter there, Jay, because we we don't do well in cold weather. We're Mediterranean folks, and we really love the the ocean, and we love uh, warm weather. So, if we can get this done before then, well, of course you can always call me. Scott, when are you? Know, so I you're gone. You're you. gone. You're gone. Uh, uh, oh, I don't. We don't leave until December. So yeah, we got. I mean, it's it's we're gonna do like a few more hours of this, man. We got we got, we got a lot more yeah, to do. Yeah, I'm I I'd love to do it, man. Just let me know when you want to do oh, it. Oh yeah, we'll hit next Thursday. You know, I mean, okay. You know, That'd and, be and awesome. we'll just. I mean, I'll send you. I'll send, I'm gonna get this up on the, and uh, some of these stories are gonna be transcribed and blasted out to to the world today uh, within the next few days because I just. You, this is this is my pocket, man. This is where I. This is all fantasy You're for me, and uh, and and uh, it's just going to keep growing and getting deeper and denser. And 
Um, but it's a brotherhood and, I, and, a, and a sisterhood, and I feel blessed to be uh, on my path. So uh, thanks for taking the time to, uh, to, to, to hang today, man. You know, Jake, this is a beautiful thing that you're doing for all of us and, and for the world because the time of the, the time period and the people you're interviewing from that time period. That, and I tell you this, Jake, not because I was blessed to be a part of it, but that was a very powerful, powerful, powerful period of where music is today. Uh, it, to me, it was one of the most essential uh, time frames of, of music history in our country. Oh, absolutely. So, and, and, you know, and, and I, I feel, it, you know, there's, there's very few things that are more universally um uh you know hormone you know bringing people together than music and when you have that oh, kind absolutely. of melting pot uh but it's like i said i mean it you're right it, it and i and i'm really doing this for my daughters and and future generations mm, so that people can can be enlightened uh as to how real music is made so yeah man great to connect uh thank you to michael shreve and uh this is just part one with tom coster and uh we're gonna uh we're gonna say goodbye now but uh we'll talk real soon man okay Thank you, Jake. I, I, I greatly appreciate it. And um, just let me know the time on Thursday. Yeah, no, we'll, the love always, man. Thank you, brother. Okay. And are, are we done? We are. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to take a break. We'll be back in the, we'll be back next week. Okay. Uh, so I, I should hang up now? Yeah, you can go. You can, you're on your way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Be I good. love you, man. You're, you're totally awesome. Yeah, love always, dude. Yeah, God bless you, Yeah, kid. bless you too, man. Okay, Later. ciao. Peace. <laughs> Just heard from Tom Coster there, legendary piano player and a, actually a better human being. And um, we thank him for taking the time today here on Power Talk. We're going to rejoin the Jim Parisi show. Thanks to Jim Parisi and everybody else here on Power Talk. We'll keep on cooking. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Peace. One near you. To check out locations, hours, and menu, visit. you live on Power Talk, please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphone, stream all of our live local shows, including Solomon on Blast and the Jim Parisi Show and the Jake Feinberg Show. And we thank you for making us part of your day today. Without further ado, I want to pick up on set two. We had a pretty extended set break, but um, we just want to pick up set two with a legendary character, better human being, great musician, better human being, Tom Coster. <laughs> Welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you, Jake. You're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> so uh let's just start out i mean can you talk about the first time that you met michael shreve <clears throat> let's see i don't think i met michael shreve before santana um i believe i met michael while i was in the loading zone uh, because at that time he was dating a wonderful uh, young lady who sang, a wonderful singer, and also played um, keyboards. Her name is Wendy Haas. Oh, yeah. She's married to, uh, who is that cat? Uh, he, Martin yeah. Mall. Martin Mall. Yeah. Martin Mall, yeah. yeah. And it's a, that's a great, it's a great combination because they're both funnier than hell. <laughs> but at, at any rate, I met, um, I met, Michael through her because uh, she ended up for a very short period of time playing keyboards and singing along with Linda in the loading zone. And it was during that period where uh, Dougie was in the band and it was kind of a new loading zone. And, and uh, that, that's, I met Michael just in passing at that time. What was your first impression of of him just as a as a person? I mean, when did you where did you get to really? I mean, did, when did you get to see him play the drums? Um, I at, later on. Obviously, I heard him play, but um, I didn't. I've never. I didn't at that point in time. I never saw him play, and then I was invited. Let's see, I wasn't invited. Um, when I was with Gabor Zabo, which was later after the loading zone, of course, I quit the loading zone to join Gabor. Um, I ended up going to the, one of the Caravan Sarai sessions mm -hmm. to pick up Dougie Rauch because Dougie, even though Dougie was in recording with Santana, he was still in Gabor's band and we were playing at the El Matador. 
And uh, and I went to pick Dougie up because Dougie didn't have a car. I don't even think Doug drive. I, I drove at that point. And I went to the session in Columbia on Folsom Street. I believe it's Folsom. And uh, went into the studio and went to pick Doug up. And Carlos asked me if I wanted to play a solo on um, on this one tune called Rhythm Fountain of Rhythm. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. I said, take, take a solo on this, this section. And I remember um, I played his solo on the roads, and uh, the roads didn't have a sustained pedal. <laughs> hmm. It's interesting, but I ended up playing the solo, and of course I was, uh, it was kind of an, it kind of jacked me up because I just went there to pick up Dougie, and then I ended up playing on this record. And I, at that time, uh, Jake, I realized. Uh, what a total drummer, in my estimation, Mike Shreve was, because he wasn't a generic rock drummer. He paid such close attention and, and had so much inspiration from from the jazz people of that time, of that of that particular time, which was in the 70s, early 70s. And his he played. He had a big sound. He had that big. We call it. Bigfoot sound, which you need in a band, a thunderous band like Santana or any any rock band that plays in loud volumes. You need that big sound, and he had it. But he also had a lot of finesse uh, when uh, the music called for it. And um, I really didn't know he played. Uh, he his vocabulary of drumming was that vast. And then when I heard the interview on your that you and Mike had, mm-hmm. I realized his history because he played in, of course, in the Dick Crest Big Band. I played in the Dick Crest Big Band and realized how many, being um, quite a bit older than Michael, of course, but nevertheless, we had similar uh, paths that, that, uh, that we had taken in our musical life. Uh, I want to read you a quote from... Uh from uh, Lester Chambers, from the Chambers Brothers, and then get your reaction to it and maybe talk about an experience that you had. Uh Uh-huh. Okay? He said, uh, getting screwed over by a record company is very hard to deal with. It's something you think about every day and it becomes a flash. You see things you want or do or could have done. It doesn't make you happy to know you can't, knowing that Columbia made billions of dollars off the Chambers Brothers music. I would think today, even if they would consider a settlement with us of any kind, it would start at $250 million. (laughs) That's the figure I have in my head. To know these things and how I have had to suffer and then find out they took my brothers Joe and Willie aside. They were easy to get to and talk to. They said, we're going to assign you your two names to the royalties and paperwork so you get all the money. It will be up to you two to split the monies with your brothers. The two brothers that got the, uh, that got that blessing deci- uh, decided that me and my other brother were fools for trusting them. Mm-hmm. If Joe got a check for 100000 my cut was maybe $500. They own the copyright and all the rights to the music. They don't mm-hmm. share with George and me, and it's not easy to talk about it sometimes. And then, you know, it's funny. I, I, I'm Obviously, you listen to the excerpt of my third interview with Michael. Uh, the full interview, um, uh, Michael talks about uh, this recent uh, reconfiguration of, of the original Santana band, or one of the Santana bands, the Santana 40 band, and um, with Neil Schoen and Roly, Greg, and uh, and Carabello. And, uh, you know, the, the cliff notes on that is that, um, you know, he, um, Michael was so jazzed up, um, Carlos had them come down to the House of Blues. It's been a couple years in the making in Vegas. They did a live show. It was recorded. Um, they got, went in the studio, cut an album. Uh, they did three dates on the East Coast. And then it was over. And there was no... Really? Yeah, and there was no explanation. Uh, and and what's, fa- what's interesting is... Well, anyway, I don't want to go too fast here, but it's like... You know, there was no... There was nothing. It wasn't like, well, we'll pick this up next year or we'll do a few dates. I mean... Carlos continued on the Santana 40 tour with his normal band and the crowds were really expecting the original band and Mm -hmm. really in a very magnanimous way Michael was just like you know I mean it was great but 
I just want more. I wanted more. Sure. And uh, and then uh, and and it's interesting. I mean, I I just curious about um, your experience uh, in this business, um, knowing that uh, it's kind of easy to. I mean, Lester Chambers is a guy who basically was homeless. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, I think Yoko Ono actually rented him a house and paid off his medical bills. I mean, the whole thing is kind of inspirational in some ways, but can you talk about how the business has treated you and, uh, and how, you know, if you did fight adversity, how you overcame it? Um, my, my situation, um, Jake is very different than the chamber brothers or Michael or any of those people. And the difference is, I stepped into an organization that was already gothic. I had nothing to do with their initial success. My being in, as far as Santana, my being in Santana, um, I I contributed some wonderful music that I wrote and co-wrote with Carlos that helped sustain the Santana band during periods where album sales went, went down substantially. So I helped sustain the band monetarily through my writing of um, and co-writing of tunes like Europa and Dance Sister Dance and Flor de Luna and things like that. Um, as far as as far as the the enorm enormity of the band, um, that was something that I walked into. So um, I, <laughs> my position is is very very different. Now, in my tenure, tenure with the band, I became second to Carlos as far as decision-making, uh, band-leading, um, musical director, that type of thing. And I don't mean that in taking anything away from Carlos. We worked as a team, um, and it, it, it went well. You know, we, we, uh, com- we complimented each other. At that point, I had more... Uh, continuity and more um, knowledge about record companies. Uh, basically, I think record companies, all of them are crooks. I, I don't know if you know this, but it's my understanding, at least it was up until the last couple of years. I, I retired two years ago, so I don't know what changes have taken place, but generally every so many years... Um, a company, a band like Santana, and their accounting firm will go in, back into the record company archives and audit them. And they generally find uh, generally <laughs> quite a bit of money that's owed to them that was never paid. And even, even, when, they, um, even when they go after the company, you got to remember this these companies are working with you they're putting your albums out so you're you're auditing them and saying look we we still want you as our record company but you owe, you owe us <laughs> x amount of dollars that sure. you never paid us right and um, as long as you're within the statute of limitations they have to pay it but they often find ways of only paying you a percentage of it and then out of that you have to pay your accounting firms, which is quite substantial. So yes, I, I find them all to be um, uh, not above board. Um, and as you know, over the years, things have changed so very, very much where bands are putting out their own records and, and selling over the internet and hoping to get uh, followings and, and um or selling them from the bandstand, and, and many bands have have done well doing this, but uh, you know, record companies, unfortunately, um, how, how would you how would you say this? It's like you they you you need them more, Jake, for distribution, um, getting your record records to places where it's very difficult for an individual to get. So there's obviously good good points about them and there's bad points and i guess it's it's up to you to to make that decision whether you're going to deal with them or not but uh i i think they're i think what they've done to people like the chamber brothers and uh, look at look at what happened to uh when they to the detroit rhythm sections back in the day um 
where they never paid them anything. They paid them, you know, small amounts of money for sessions. And here, here these rhythm sections came up with these amazing riffs that ended up being uh, used in the tunes that sold millions and millions of units. And and to this day, these these folks, you know, are they don't have that much money, and they deserve to have basically hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions. So sure, uh, they're, I, I, I don't think they're uh, above board in, in, in my interpretation, but it's like, a, it's like um, an, uh, an evil that you need, <laughs> and then you have to deal with them and hopefully have people in your organization that continually uh, has a noose around their neck to make sure that they're honest with you if there is such a thing with a record company. Do you, do you think, um, I mean, as best you can, uh, I, I find today with, especially with, with, with luminary bands or, or you know, uh, figures that were, uh, you know, highly accessible, you know, in the, uh, maybe in the 60s and 70s, just as, as, as bandmates, handlers have really... Uh, gotten in the way of musical collaboration. I, you know, I, I interviewed, I did my third interview with McLaughlin um, uh, earlier this year, and and it was a similar thing with with Car. I'm not trying to bag on Carlos at all. He's just, you know, there's just this is just a situation where they met in in Montreux, and and McLaughlin was jamming with Carlos's band, and then Carlos was all jazzed up to do this uh, uh, interpretation reinterpretation of Supernova by Wayne Shorter. And he wanted to uh, have Herbie and Wayne Shorter and, uh, you know, and uh, maybe Cindy Blackman playing drums uh, and, and McLaughlin. And so they went to the promoter at, at Montreux and they were all about it. Or it was a super group. And uh, the plan was to do it at the uh, maybe the Hollywood Bowl. And, and McLaughlin never heard never heard anything. Right. So he mm-hmm. just never heard back at all. And mm-hmm. to me, it's just like, I mean, I just wonder to me. There was so much elasticity. I mean, you walk into the studio. Carlos is like, "Hey, man, can you you want to lay down a a, a keyboard track on this?" Uh, you know, I, I mean, David Crosby after his uh, his uh, his girlfriend died, uh, and he made "If I Could Only Remember My Name." I mean, those the musicians. I guess what I'm trying to say is the musicians have been cut off from the other musicians in, in some well, way. Well, I just want to get your you... get your get your thoughts on that. It just seems to me like when you get silence. It means that there are handlers that are just sort of. I, I have this my own problem with this on my radio show, where I literally have to go and connect with family members, or the you know, in order to get around these people who are like, well, he's not, he's not syndicated, he's not part of Rolling Stone, so therefore I'm not going to put my million dollar or whatever, however much these people are, I'm just not going to do it because it's it's uh, it's all about money, really. Well, is this thing that you were talking about with McLaughlin and and Herbie and and Wayne was that something fairly recently? It was the, no, and it, yeah, it was this. Year, it happened about two or three weeks ago, and McLaughlin was very straightforward. He goes, you know, he called, he called, I guess he emailed Carlos, said, "What's up?" You know, and, and I and he and he never heard anything, and and he said, "That's cool, I I I'm okay," and he he just you know he just sort of respects the fact that Carlos really idolizes and would love to be a jazz, like loves the jazzers and loves Wayne and Herbie. And they just did the concert and McLaughlin was never, I don't know if they thought that he'd overshadow. I don't know what the rationale was, but it's the silence part. Uh, it's, it's yeah. no different. I mean, it really, I mean, if you really, really look at it, when Donald Trump does, finally, he said it today, you know, Barack Obama is, was born in this country. But mm-hmm. the fact is that when you don't have any accountability, when you don't, ha- mm-hmm. when there's no accountability, uh, that's when uh, w- any kind of community can easily fall apart. And I understand. I'm not trying to be Pollyannish. I know that you know rough stuff happens. I mean, the Lester Chambers thing is is a galling thing. It's just interesting to me that that it just falls on you know you don't even get a response. You know. Well, here's the thing. It, you know, I'm kind of out of the loop with all this. Although, I, I did see on Car on the Santana um, uh, webpage, I guess you call That's it, right. that yeah. um, they were doing these concerts. 
So, in other words, the concerts did happen, if I understand I'm sorry, yeah, what the you're concert, saying correctly, the but they went, happened yeah, without the, John. It, well, it was it, the conception of the idea occurred with Carlos and John brainstorming, and then it died there, and John was not part of it. It went, it, it went through, but uh-huh. not with, yeah, Sans McLaughlin. Yeah, um, my, my history with Carlos, uh, which was about eight years, and I can, here again, I can only give you my interpretation. No, that's fine. yeah. He, he is an incredible, he has great admiration uh, for people who are jazz players. He has incredible admiration and one of the reasons I even got in the band, not to put myself in, in the same company as, as some of the jazz people he's played with, but that's one of the reasons I got the gig. I mean, let's face it, because at that period of time, Michael and Carlos were going into, um, they were heavily inspired by Mahavishnu and the, the Electric Miles and Weather Report and, and Return to Forever. So... You know, they wanted people like me and Richard Kermode in the band to help them get into that, go into that direction, which was um, they they wanted to expand what Santana was. They wanted to reach out and tell the Santana audience that there was more to the band than just a black magic woman, oh, you come, come of I, et cetera, um, which I admire that. It did it as far as monies um, and and album sales. Uh, they faltered because the audience, of course, didn't particularly care for the direction of the band at that time in the seventies. But nevertheless, Carlos had had and Michael, but continuously with Carlos because Michael eventually left the band. Has great admiration. Now, what happens? Jake, at least what happened when I was in the band, whenever Carlos would have these ideas, which was from the goodness of his heart, uh, once they get into the hands of um, his, the people who manage him, they look at the logistics of it, not necessarily music, (laughs) which I think you already brought out. They look at it from a logistic and monetary view, and they'll often talk Carlos out of it. You know, he, Carlos doesn't really want to, but they talk him out of it because of whatever. That ultimately, it's not the best. It's it's not for the betterment of everyone involved. And I think Carlos um, here again, it's hearsay, but I think he he's, he feels so bad that he doesn't want to contact these people, which, of course, is not cool, because if you love somebody, no matter whether it's good news or bad news, you have to, you have to contact them. But, you know, I, this is hearsay for me because I know how much he loves doing things like this. I do know that for a fact that management often gets involved and will talk the artist into it or out of it. And I'm sure that's what happened in this case. As far as contacting John, you know, um, you know what it is. I, you know, I, I just I, I want to be clear. Just just for, for you know to be completely, uh, you know, for full disclosure. I mean, it's like, I mean, there was a lot of investment uh, spiritually. I think the thing that I did, I left out of the story was that when my you know when when the when the project started, and they got together the first time before. Uh, Carl Peraza and the bass player. Um, oh, you now you're talking about Santana Four. Santana Four. Okay, yeah. I, and yeah, no. What, 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 with Michael, it was like, uh, you know, um, it, th- he said when they hit for the first time in how many? New, who knows how many years? He said it was magical. Oh, it was gr- great. And I contacted Michael multiple times and said, Michael, this is going to be huge. Because to me, when he, when I heard this, the tracks that they did, I said, "This is really Santana." You have to remember any any met any band that has made musical history, Santana being one of them. The history was made by like a great tasting stew with all these wonderful magical ingredients. The ingredients 
the ingredients of the San, original Santana band was magical. And getting them back together is basically using the same ingredients for the most part. Those ingredients don't exist in the current band. The current band is a completely different band. Of course, Carlos Santana as an individual is a, is a superstar of enormity at this point. So you know he can go on and on and on for the rest of his life, touring and doing exactly what he wants. But to me, when I heard Santana 4, I said this, they're back to the way they sounded uh, when they first got together in the 60s. So sure, now, now <laughs> with the success of Santana 4, uh, like you say, people wanting to hear the band, what do you think, what, <laughs> what do you think management is going to do <laughs> when they've got that going and the band that Carlos is currently in, it's. I don't. I. I would guess that that management uh, would have a difficult time with Carlos being involved in two bands like that. Well, you. I mean, you are as usual being extremely eloquent. I. You know, to me, it. Uh... Well, I have to be because I'm still associated with the band in, in 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 certain aspects. Sure. Did, did, did you uh, did you get did you have a, a good I, I, one guy that it's funny I on this journey I I, I don't profess to be a, a, a Santana aficionado at all um, at, you know I mean in any way shape or form um, but I've tapped into now you're the latest cat and um, and I didn't it's very cool to go back it's interesting because I, I like a lot of the 70s stuff that you guys were, were doing um sonically and stretching out the band um it, one guy that that i never thought i'd be able to get a hold of but because uh um through um a dear friend of mine jerry cortez the guitar player uh he connected me with uh, david margan and, uh -huh. and margan uh and then i went to uh, san francisco with my wife we finally took our honeymoon after uh, 11 years of marriage and two kids and i was wow. out, i was out in berkeley and uh and I and I and, and I texted Morgan and we, we hung out and ate bear, bear claws at his house. And, you know, I just I wanted to know if you could tell a, a great Dave Morgan story. I, I found this album. Uh, well, not Moonflowers. And I, you you did collaborate with Morgan. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about uh, what, what you know, where you came down on on, on that. Cat. I, I, I've never written a collaboration in, as far as music uh, writing of music. I never did. I never. um experienced David Morgan, and this is not saying he isn't or wasn't, but um, never experienced him being a writer of, of songs or of music. I, he never approached me, at least to my, in, in my remembrance. I guess my, the better uh, point is that the, the, but you guys were, you overlapped in the Santana band, though. I mean, you, oh, yeah. So I can, thought his bass playing and, and that that particular time was one of the best Santana bands I'd, I'd ever experienced. Can you explain why? Um, I, I believe that David, uh, is, he, he was just a great player. And uh, there was a, a, a harmony between, a magical, a magic between him and, and, and the rhythm section of the band, and he, he got along well with everyone. A nice looking kid. I mean, every, he had everything that we needed as a bass player at that time. And um, you know, rhythm sections are unique, uh, Jake, because I've played with so many of them, and I've been blessed to play with some of the best drummers in in, in the universe. And it's interesting playing with uh, these rhythm sections because, as a keyboard player, I don't I drive the rhythm. I drive the rhythm section, but I don't create it. They create it, and I become a part of it. Like working with Billy Cobham, mm -hmm. I've worked with him with various rhythm sections. And one of the things that a keyboard player must do is when you're, you're playing with a rhythm section that you haven't played with before, you have to listen. You have to listen where that drummer and that bass player is, is putting the time and then when you come in with an organ part or whatever comp part you come up with or whatever solo you take, 
you just can't go wherever you feel. You have to go with, the, with where that rhythm section is going and what we call hook up with it. And that's the magic of it. And David, David he, when he came into the band, he hooked up with that rhythm section in a way that made it magical. Um, there's nothing worse than playing in a rhythm section where there's a push and pulling of the bass player and the drummer, and not because they're not good musicians. They're not feeling, they're not feeling the time. One is not feeling the time where the other one is feeling the time. Mm-hmm. And, that, and, and it's, it becomes burdenous. For me, I can't do it. If I'm playing with a rhythm section and it's not hooked up, that's the end. To me, it's about that magic carpet ride that you take that we talked about in the first interview Mm -hmm. that takes place. The only way that that magic carpet ride can come to fruition for me, Jake, is that the rhythm section is in sync with one another and, and putting down that rhythm that just takes you to another level of expression. And when David came into the band, he he hooked up with the rhythm section in such a way that it was very it was it was just it was just a joy. And during that period, um, it was very very magical. And and I I think I left when Dave was in the band. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, no, you did. I guess Moonflower together. Uh, you were on a, a few tracks of that, but then. Um, and it's, uh, Amigos, I just found that out. I really like that album a lot. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a good album. It's funny. I just found it like a few days after we talked. And uh, can you re- go back to uh, that? Um, the I, the name is escaping me, but the, the, the that legendary concert in Japan, I guess in seventy five, um, that was on that eventually came out on vinyl. Um, where it was like yeah, th- I don't think it was. I think it was before seventy five. It very well could have been. I I just wanted to, you to talk about. I mean, that to me was like, uh, I'm not sure. Sh- truthfully, I mean, can you honestly say that you did you have to time stop and sort of um, talk through just the idea of or or listen through how to how to hear everything because there was so much percussion. <laughs> I mean, you could add just like, you know, you know, Amando Praza, but it was like it seemed like there were like six or seven different <laughs> percussive instruments on the stage and I I mean, for the audience, I mean, it was pulsating, but how do you figure out if you if if you in that situation if you can't hear, how do you um get your point across and communicate with the other guys in the band. Do you stop it? Do you talk it out? How do you do it? Well, the, that was called, that album was probably one of my very, very favorite albums. It's called Lotus. Lotus. Thank you. And, and it, it came about unexpectedly that we when it was the first time Santana had ever been to Japan. So there was a magic in that. And, it was pretty amazing because when we um, when we landed in Japan, it was kind of like the Beatles. It was insanity. What did it look like? Can you paint that picture for the audience? Well, I know how rabid we, the Japanese. I know how rabid they are about their freakish. autographs and things. Yeah. So, well, uh, well, everywhere we went, they and even a person like myself who was a new, who was really relatively new in the band, uh, Richard. Kermod and I and um, Leon Thomas were the newest people in the band, but of course they, as you, as you so aptly put it, they they are so aware of everybody in the band. So everywhere we went, they would chase us and pull on us. I mean, they were respectful, but they were so excited to be near us. So um, it was it was exciting in many many ways that we um, were there for the first time and. The Budokan, we sold it out. I think it was five concerts in a row, which in itself was very Mm history-making. And um, uh, then, and it was that it that particular band, Jake was was a very very creative band. It was the band that we went out on tour to play all this new music that we that Michael and Carlos envisioned that would take 
the band to another level, and it was something that um, Michael, here again, Michael and Carlos were the spearhead, at least in my remembrance, to, to, to say something different um, and, and kind of not, not compete, but uh, try to make music like McLaughlin and Carlo, uh, excuse me, Miles and, and Weather Report. And a lot of the music, oh my God, was so much like that. But what made it different for us is we had all that Latin percussion, which took the music to another level. Now, as far as, as how do you play to it, um, it's interesting playing, again, with all the diff- these different drummers, you know, Dennis Chambers and... Steve Smith. And, and, and Steve and, and, and Graham Lear and Indugo Leon Chancellor. And, <laughs> uh, That's I, right. I, you I, and, you, that, that, that was the cool thing about Amigo. You and, you and Indugo uh, co-wrote some songs on that album, if I remember correctly. Yeah, we were... We, we, at that time, CBS... Um, we had this sort of a meeting with CBS, and they said, "You guys really, really need to 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 do a top ten record because your album sales are not doing that well." And at that time, prior to the recording of that album, uh, we were on tour with Earth, Wind, and Fire for about eleven weeks in Europe, and Indugo and I were very much inspired by. Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, spiritually, musically, um, we loved them to death. We hung out together for those eleven weeks, and uh, and Dugo and I uh, had a little keyboard, and we wrote a lot of those tunes in our in our room in, take in me, various take hotels. Me, take me with you, uh, dance, sister, dance. Tell me, are you tired? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we wrote those tunes because we. We're trying to reach out and do a uh, an album that would would eventually get up on the charts, and we were so in, impressed with with all, with everything that Earth, Wind, and Fire was doing, and we did this wonderful record. and And Jake, it, it made it it was a top ten album, so we achieved our goal. And of course, Europa uh, had a lot to do with that as well. And can we I, didn't know you, what. I, we, I want to ask you a question though, because you're the. I mean. I always talk to the cats about, you know, you, you create hits when you're not trying to make a hit. I mean, I, that's what this that's what this was. Really? Because you said that the, the, no. the, the company already said you better get in gear. So you knew you had to make it. Well, hit. well, you do. You do what you what we tried to do. It wasn't hits, Jake. It was music that we hoped the kids could relate to. But it, we didn't think for a moment it was going to be a hit. Um, it, we what we tried to do was bring the band back to what everyone says their roots, you know, quote unquote. Um, I don't think any of us wrote anything that we thought was going to be a hit, but, but we were hoping uh, to get somewhere in the middle there of of the tunes being accepted by the audience by having similar uh, a similar approach to the music that some of the earlier songs had um you never really i never really tried to write a tune and say it was going to be a hit because i don't have that ability to say that something is going to be a hit and more than not it's not going to be (laughs) you know i'm not gamble and huff i'm not coming from a place where these guys are monsters and and they they write one hit after the other. Yeah, Holland but, Dozier, yeah. Mm-hmm, and there's so many of them, right. you know. That's all they do. They, yeah. <laughs> they write these mega tunes and one after the other. But um, I, did, I did do something, though, for the album after Amigos. When we wrote Europa, uh, here again, it was not meant to be, we never thought of it, Carlos and I, being a hit. But of all the music that I wrote for the band and co-wrote with, with various members of the band, and especially Carlos, that tune came together the quickest. And there's something to be said about tunes that are truly, truly big hits for those individual bands. This was one of them. It's become a classic for Santana. And when I, when I hear documentaries about other bands who have written hits, 
so many of them, Jake, wrote they, the tunes just came magically and 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 uh, um, without they they just come out of your heart and soul, and there's no there's no real work involved. It just comes out um, like it was meant to be, and there's so many songs that I hear from other artists that that the hits happened in that same fashion. The, you know, um, and yeah, no, go ahead, continue. So what happened? I, I call it, I call it catching up with the wind. Hmm. I felt when when I helped when I co-wrote San, uh, Europa with Santana, that I caught up with the wind. So the next album, I wrote a tune, Flor de Luna, and that also has generated a lot of success for Santana. So once you write a hit or a tune that eventually becomes a hit, uh, it's w- what happens, it's, it's like a formula at that point. And then you try to emulate or duplicate that formula. But you, in, in the effort of doing that, you have to realize that music is generally um, follows the demeanor of what's happening in the world. I, I really believe in that. And it, the, the temperament of what's happening in our world at that time, I feel music, whatever comes out in artist follows that temperament. And so in the process of, of this formula, you can't, you can't uh, do the formula verbatim. You, have to, you, you, you do the formula, but you also have to realize what's happening in the world and kind of fine-tune the formula to fit that that temperament, I don't know if I'm if it's no. I compl- I mean I, I don't. I mean uh, it's. I don't want to be overly overly simplistic, but I think that you're. Uh, I think that you're dead on. I mean, I think it yeah, does reflect the, the the energy that is happening. Yes, it's a reflection of yes. That's that's exactly. It. At least that's that's what I feel. Did you did you um I, I was I when I talked to Rico uh, he he said that. Uh, like with Sly, someone would say on the way out, you know, oh yeah, Sly, just like everyday people, you know, and he'd write it mm-hmm. down on the back of an envelope or something, and next thing you know, the band's in there and they're getting into a jam, and next, that's how the song did. A lot of the songs happen. Uh, you said it didn't take a lot of work, but did they happen like in that same kind of vein where there was uh, lyrics or a melody, and then it all just sort of was constructed uh, by the band itself? Well, it, most of the music that uh, um, that that was written while I was in the band, uh, most of it was generated uh, on the road by Carlos and I. Not so much by me. Um, I kind of took a back a back seat to a lot of the stuff because <clears throat> I didn't I didn't want to. I kind of went with what I guess you'd call it going with the flow. And Carlos would come up to me and say, "Tom, do you have? Um, we we don't have sound check until you know four o'clock, and we've got a few hours. Um, can we get together and go over some ideas I have?" So most of the ideas were generated by by Carlos himself. The only the only album that I really did a lot of um, ideas that were generated my by me was with Indugo. That was the one album that we kind of used to, uh, how would you say, we took matters into our own hands and came up with, with our own ideas. And then Carlos, of course, would have his ideas. So most of the things we did, Carlos and I, Carlos would come to me as the keyboard player and come up with these ideas. And then we would take him into the band rehearsal and then the band would add percussion and not necessarily vocals because it, it, there weren't many vocals when I was in the band. It was more of an instrumental band. And so the tunes were basically written like that. And any individuals that in the band that had ideas, uh, they would bring them to me. And I would, as here again, as a keyboard player, player like uh, Samba di Sa- Sasalito, that was brought to me. Um, Chapito came to me and said, can I help him write a tune? Uh, the the um, 
tune that was written by uh, Armando. He came to me as a keyboard player and said, Tom, can you help me with this tune? Um, in both of those situations, I personally never asked for anything. Um, that, that was my way of contributing and giving back to the band. I was never in one of those capacities where I caused an argument for a division of a tune. I have felt that it was it was my position to help people, and it would come back to me in different ways. And I, I sincerely believed in that, and it always did. So at the end of the, of the tunes that were going to be allocated for the album, then a meeting was held, and the people would decide who got what for the tunes, and things usually would go quite smoothly in that respect. But a lot of the tunes were generated by Carlos to me and then presented to the band in that fashion. And then here again, an individual would bring a tune in, and I would help him with that, and then that was presented to Carlos if he felt it was worthy of being on the album. Can you just uh, put us inside the hotel room of you and Ndugu when you were, after seeing that Earth, Wind, and Fire being inspired and how uh, uh, how you worked together, to, considering that that was really a very unique experience in the sense that uh, you guys took your own initiative and, and, uh, and created stuff on your own. I know you mentioned you had a little piano in there. Yeah, we had a little portable electric keyboard, and I, I loved Indugo. I mean, he's just he's just such a great guy, and he's a dear friend, friend to this day. And you know, we he he would make me laugh, and I would make him laugh, and so there was there's that wonderful wonderful brotherhood and camaraderie. And so Indugo and I would say, well, let's let's get together on our own and and see what we can come up with, you know. So. Um, we first we decide on what kind of a mood, mood being what kind of rhythm connotation, whether we wanted it to have some funk to it, uh, whether we want it to uh, be, um, you know, a Latin, a Latin rhythm. So we would determine what kind of a groove we wanted, and then he would start playing it on whatever he brought into the room with him. And, of course, he's such a great drummer, you couldn't help but feel the groove. And then I would start writing uh, chords, and, and, and then we both would come up with the melody. In fact, uh, Tell Me Are You Tired, of course, he, that was, uh, I think he wrote the lyrics to that. I'm not sure, or David Rubinson, I'm not sure. But uh, that's basically how we did it. And, you know, there were times when stuff didn't fit properly, and we'd say, well, let's try this, or let's try that. I mean, it, it, it wasn't something like where you could write one or two songs <laughs> in a day. It took a while, and um, because we knew that we had to write something in a particular direction for it to even be accepted for the record. Right. Um, so we had to, we, had, we spent a lot of time together um, thinking about it, and, and finally we would, you know, had a little tape recorder, and that's the way it was in those days, because everything at that time, um, it was you know vinyl and CD. I don't even know at that time was it. Still, yeah, uh, I still, guess it, still heavy. No, the CD was nowhere to be found. It was a still yeah. all vinyl and, and and analog cassette. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. God, I'm so old, Jake. I've forgotten. The no, history it's of actually it all. you know it's you, you know you're just you're getting younger every day. You don't know that. <laughs> Hey, you know, but you know what I yeah. loved about that tune, Tell Me How You're Tired? I got to, to play a road solo on that, which was way out of the realm of, of original Santana, and I still love that solo to this day. It kind of had a little, hope I'm not stepping on my own my own uh, <laughs> feet here, but it had that little bit of a headhunter um, thing to it, you know. Uh, oh, I love it. Yeah, I love, no, so you're saying it was more organ-based? Santana? No, I played a road no, no, solo. No, no, I'm saying like what you said it was it was uncharacteristic of Santana to play the to Yeah, play because the, I it was roads it was like a kind of like a jazz uh road solo on that too. I love it. Yeah, cuz Indugu, yeah. man, I mean, I've done two interviews with Indugu and he, you know, that dude, you listen to some of the stuff he was doing with Hampton Hawes in the early 70s, mm -hmm. it is uh and some of the stuff he did for Fantasy, I mean just gig sessions I mean, I, 
I mean, one of the most – everybody knows him for doing Michael Jackson, but that guy was a stone – I mean, he could really play – uh, you know, free. Yeah, George Duke. He did a lot with George. Thank you. He did a lot. I, I just uh, free, free jazz, pop, funk, funky blues. Yeah. Jazz. I mean, did the guy? He made it seem effortless, and his time was impeccable, and his feel was so good too. Him and Henry Franklin made a great rhythm team there. He did just, just, just phenomenal. Thing. And it's really cool that to know that you guys were. Uh, this this album is taking on a whole new uh, sort of relevancy uh, for me now. I um, you know, I just. Tom is. Uh, I want to talk to you about a cat. Uh, I've, 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 it seems like I've interviewed all all these guys. Um, is uh, Larry Coriel? When, when when did you uh, when did you how did you connect with Larry? Um, I connected with Larry through a project, a, a company, and a record company that Steve was involved in. I think it was called Tone Centers. Hmm. Tone Center, and it was uh, it was it was the, the person who owned that company. He wanted nothing but fusion, so he thought that a good a good um, combination would be Larry, uh, Steve, and myself. And I briefly met um, Larry at the Montreux Jazz Festival that I did with Cobham back in 78, just in passing. But And I knew, of course, about his music because one of my favorite bands was the, I think it was called the 11th House. Mandel and, and Alpha. Al yeah, Zone. That yeah was, those guys were that ferocious. Was killing shit, man. Yeah, it was and it was, I've always been attracted to that music, you know. So when we got together, that was the first time I'd met him when he, arrived at Steve's house, because we recorded the album in Steve's studio when he lived in Novato. He, of course, sold that home uh, some years ago, but at that time, most of, a lot of those Tone Center records, uh, Mike Varney was the guy who owned the company, and Steve um, and him kind of hooked up in that they would do many of those records at in St- Steve's studio in Novato, and that's basically when I first met Larry, Oh, and then I went on a later on Cobham tour. Are you there? I hear, yeah. Yeah, we went on a Cobham tour, uh, and it was Larry Coriel and myself. And um, God, I'm trying to. I always forget the bass player's name. It was it Al, Al, uh, Al Al Johnson? No, not Alfonso. Uh, Victor Victor, um, not Victor Wooten. The, he played in Weather Report. Why do I always forget his name? Yeah, no, I'm trying to... He's, he's, he's unfortunately, has some health issues with um, Vic, Victor... Man, he was with Weather Report. For oh, was I, I'll look it up. Um, God, I, can't, I don't know why... I don't know why I can't... I have a tr- problem remembering his name. But, yeah, it was... Uh, Victor, Victor, myself. Victor Bailey. Victor Bailey. Victor Bailey. Victor Bailey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great bass player, great guy. And then we went later on. We I toured with that band of in Europe for a while. Yeah, but I I had never really played with Larry until uh, until we did that record on um, with uh, over at Steve's place. Uh, well, before we wrap up set two here, I wanted to. I wanted to, we've been cooking for 52 minutes here. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned off air that you met Stan Getz one time. Well, how did you, how did that happen? Um, <laughs> interesting. I was playing with Santana and uh, was in New York and in a, a little dressing room we had, uh, there was a gentleman s- sitting there with his back to me. And uh, Ray Etzler, who who was road managing the band at that time, a wonderful guy and a wonderful road manager, and at, and at some point he he really was the manager of the band, but he would never go there. He said, "Tom, I have some uh, someone I'd like you to meet." And as if it were rehearsed, um, 
stand spins around on this chair. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, hi, Tom, it's Stan Getz. And I said, wow, man, you're like one of my heroes, you know. And, and he stayed for the gig, and, and uh, um, it was a, a very spiritual moment for me to be able to, you know, it's always spiritual to meet these folks. And, of course, so many of them I had an opportunity to eventually uh, share the bandstand with or, or even work with, you know. So that was a very, um, very why, special moment for me. Why, why, I mean, maybe it's self-evident, but why, why was he a hero to you? Um, I, he, to me, people who take music and become adventurous with it, I, I'm sure the word adventurous is different, and it's in, the, it's in the eye of the beholder. But when he did albums like Focus, and he had a tone that no one else, ha- I have never heard anyone, I'm sure there are people now, but he, he, was, he was blessed with a, uh, a swing, um, a tone, an energy, that to me stands out among the very essence of Miles and Coltrane and Bill Evans and people like that, that um, it's, to me, Jake, it's a, it's a unique group of people. There are a lot of great musicians, obviously, in the world, but they, to me, a lot of them are, um, they... They, they they generate incredible musicianship, but they're kind of and I I don't want to I don't want to I use this word loosely, but clones of other people who who were the origin or originators of that sound or that energy, like you hear people trying to play like Train, and sure they some of them get kind of close, but Train holds the trophy. Miles holds the trophy, at least in my mind. That's right. Um, Bill Evans holds the trophy. Uh, Stan Getz holds the trophy. And, and, and to meet him, I was like, holy crap. This is one of my spiritual leaders here. I mean, you know, when you hear Stan play, even to this day, who plays like him? Right. Well, no, I mean, I, know? I, getting, I mean, how, just what's your advice for cats? Because... There's so much comping going on. There's so much. Everything's interconnected with YouTube. These clones are so easily created now. How, what is your advice, not even from a technical point of view, just from a feel and from a, 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 just from a a, 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 a humanistic point of view, how do you take the genius and the, and borrow, beg, borrow, and steal like a thief and then ultimately develop your own sound because michael said the same to me same thing to me you could transcribe one of these elvin jones solos Mm -hmm. in a coltrane uh tune i mean you can do it but it's not going to sound it's just it's like you know it's not going to sound the way the right way i mean you know what i'm getting at but what would be oh absolutely well well i i say this to people all the time and i don't bring it up they bring it up to me they could they say to me that you know tom when we hear a record um and we know who you are we can hear that it's you playing um of course my sound isn't that of a stan gets it's not that universal or a carlos santana but the way that i look at it and i try to explain this to young people because you know obviously they they look at me and ask me all these questions how did you do this that whatever i believe that each one of us are uniquely are unique people uh, genetically in our in our own place i mean uh you know you and i love music but spirit Genetically, we're very different. So we're, we're, your foods that you might choose and my foods that I might choose could be very different, right, that's, Jake? I mean, it's, absolutely. We, we have our own taste of what we want. Although I will, I will go down and get fish tacos in Porta 
where Puerto Vallarta. Puerto sure. Vallarta. No, yeah. You're Go ahead. Welcome. Man. Too. Right on, man. Yeah, but but <laughs> the thing is, when I look back at my life, J- Jake, and I listen to all these players, man, because that's I would every day I made I made it a point to listen to music three or four hours a day. I'd buy all the records, you know, as much as I could afford because I really didn't have much money. And I'd listen and I'd listen and I'd listen. Now, let's say I played 10 records in that one day, that one period of time. I, I realized as time went on that my subconscious would, would draw out of each of those records whatever it was that my genetic musical makeup thought was really what I wanted to play like. Like if I heard if I heard Oscar Peterson play, I would draw something from him. If I heard Wynton Kelly play, I would draw something from him. I was very, very moved by the phrasing of of um Fats Navarro and Clifford Brown and all the horn players. I just didn't I wasn't inspired just by keyboard players, Jake. I was inspired by all instruments. Absolutely. You know, the bebop guitar playing, um, uh, Scott LaFaro, the bass playing, the lyrical, the, lyric, the lyricalness and, and, and harm, the depth of harmony from each of these players. Were, oh, well, over time, Jake, all those little ingredients create your own recipe. And, and what, what I display in my playing is really uh, little bits and pieces of cannonball and all these incredible people that I just mentioned. And I try to, to come up with what inspires me when I play, when I comp. One of, my, one of the best compers I ever thought, um, I mean, was Wynn Kelly. I mean, I'm sorry, um, Vic Feldman. Sure. Man, when I heard Vic comping on 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 that album, uh, Cannonball Adderley, live at the at the Lighthouse, and then he went with with the Seven Steps to Heaven, where he used Herbie and him. I said, man, this the comping, and I'm not saying it was better than anyone else in the world at that time, but it I I identified with it. And I tried to comp like him, not getting in anybody's way. And that's one of the things that all the people that I have worked with in my lifetime have said, man, Tom, you comp so well. You, you compliment the artist, the, the soloist, but you don't get in his way. And so there's so many, there's so many things that who I am as a player came, came from people that for some reason they shined in, they shined more than someone else. Here again, Jake, not to say that they were any better, but uh, the taste of their playing uh, was something that I, I gravitated to, and, and through all that, it made me the player that I am today. And I, I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, no, or, I, mean, it's, I, I, I mean, I thought I actually enjoy, I enjoyed both set, both set one and set two. I really thought think that you were you were waxing poetic even harder today than than set one actually i really you're oh that's wonderful i well i i hope i'm doing something that of interest to your listeners and well i've already transcribed three i'll send you some of the transcriptions and i'll put this whole thing together in an audio file and send it to you but i mean some of the stuff i mean what did i what did i uh transcribe so far um let me just get it here Yeah, you know, the the organo. Uh, I transcribed <laughs> yeah. the organo. Uh, you know, your idea of um, again, you know, being unique as individuals, uh, African Americans' ability to swing, and then ultimately the one that resonated the most. I think it got somewhere between. I mean, it's still percolating, and it's got about anywhere between seventy to eighty likes, six, seven comments, going into time. Uh, that was the name of the, was the little thing that, and that, that was your breakdown of, of um, 
what Tony Williams and Ron Carter were doing where they broke up the time yes. and then they'd go back into time. So, yes. I mean, uh, I, your son's having a ball. Uh, this stuff's been going bouncing around. So, I mean, it, I, I, and I look forward to doing part three. I, I, uh, I, sure. I you, so you mean to say that you've already put some, posted some of this stuff and people are commenting on it? Coster, people are, I can tell you right now that the, the going into time when Tony Williams and Ron Carter came into playing with Miles, they lo- no longer just played straight ahead. Ding, 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 ding. Dotted eighth note to the 16th note swing. Rather, they broke the time up. That just messed me up. I thought it was so beautiful. They're breaking up the time, and there's freedom. And then all of a sudden, on My Funny Valentine, they start going into time. It lifted my entire being. That whole mm-hmm. concept of no longer just playing hard bop, but breaking up the time and everybody having a space to create. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. there, there were older drummers that were like, yeah, Max did that. Max Roach did that first. I mean, you know, anything from that, to, you know, so it, my four, these these are vibrant forums, you know. Oh, how and wonderful. It's it's classic. And, uh, and you'd be giddy just to see him because... Uh, and they're going to take off even more, you know, and I'm friends with Michael Shreve on Facebook and that, you know, I'm, you know, and, and Dave, David Morgan. So, you know, you put these quotes up and it makes them, you know, that they're feeling good about it. And it, Oh and, yeah, and it, and absolutely. It, well, it brings everybody back together, Jake, you're doing, you're educating people to, to, to a period that they don't know about, which is priceless. They, j- they don't know where well, a lot of this Ultimately, stuff... like you said, it's probably the most special time in our musical history. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. thankfully, through modern medicine and just better health awareness, you guys are still alive, and mm-hmm. we have the technology now uh, to do it comprehensively, Coster. So, uh, yeah. yeah, we'll be in touch to do part three, man. Uh, much love to you and, and the fam. I look forward Thank to Thank you, man. And just let me know when you want to do that, and I'll be there for you. you uh, much love, man. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. All okay. Right, God bless. Bless you too, man. Stay cool, dude. <laughs> Later, man. Okay, ciao. Cheers. <laughs> Talking to Tom Coster there on the Jake Feinberg Show. We'll be back tomorrow at uh, noon, high noon Pacific. For uh, the regular edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, reminder, next Tuesday, uh, I got Johnny Mathis on at 10.30 in the morning to talk about his relationship with the great Stan Getz. We will now rejoin the Jim Parisi Show on Power Talk Live. People. These are tremendously talented people.